Let's go. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, on this first virtual shadowing opportunity from the pre-med team. Um, my name is David Janicek. I am uh, a fourth year anesthesia resident at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Department of Anesthesiology. Um, and uh, I'm also the advisor here at the pre-med team. So if you haven't been to one of our meetings yet over the past couple of weeks, um, welcome. And uh, we're excited to get started. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, a topic near and dear to my heart, which is anesthesia. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, just in terms of the format of the session, if you guys have questions, please uh, send them in the chat. Uh, we'll collect those and then there'll be two opportunities, one at the 30 minute mark and then one at the end of the presentation uh, for you guys to uh, you know, get those questions answered. And uh, we'll go through as many as we can, um, time permitting. So let's uh, jump right into it here. So, all right, so just a little outline for today. Um, I'll do a little quick introduction. I'll talk about you know, why maybe I went into anesthesia and may, why you may want to go into anesthesia. Um, and then we'll talk about what is anesthesia, the history, uh, you know, kind of a typical day, uh, and uh, how do you become an anesthesiologist. Then we'll have a break for questions. And then finally, I'll go through a quick case um, that uh, kind of shows you what the anesthesiologists think about. Um, and uh, hopefully that drums up some great conversation. So, all right, first and foremost, uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from uh, Benton, North Iowa, a small town in uh, Eastern Iowa, right along the Mississippi between Illinois and Iowa. Uh, I attended the University of Iowa where I studied the uh, physiology um, and also had a minor in business administration. I stayed at the University of Iowa for medical school uh, where I graduated in 2017. And then I went on to the, uh, where I'm at now is the University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, where I will uh, graduate from residency in June. Um, after residency, I'm going to go on to do a cardiac uh, anesthesia fellowship down at Auctioner Health in, uh, in New Orleans. So uh, very excited about that. And we'll talk a little bit more about fellowships later on in the, in the presentation. So um, my path to anesthesia started pretty early, honestly. Um, so I would say it really started in high school. Uh, I had an anatomy and physiology class uh, where I was able to job shadow uh, in the anesthesiologist at a local hospital. And that kind of just blew my, you know, my mind open in terms of I, I never really had any experience with anesthesia. I never had surgery before, um, but I was like, this is an awesome experience, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to learn more. Um, so, um, uh, sorry, I just saw a message. Let me see if I can. Admit a few more individuals. Welcome, welcome. All right. So, uh, in in college, I studied physiology, like I said before, um, and I worked as a anesthesia technician. Um, so, with that, uh, what that involves is really just uh, turning over operating rooms uh, in between surgeries, um, and uh, you know, helping anesthesiologists out with anything that you needed uh, for the case, whether it's supplies or anything like that. Um, it was a really great experience because I got to talk to a lot of anesthesia residents, figure out that, you know, that is actually what I wanted to go into um, in medical school. Um, and it, uh, you know, got me in the operating room setting. So um, if you have an opportunity to do anything in the operating room, you know, as an undergrad, definitely take the advantage uh, if you're interested in anesthesia, if you're interested in surgery, anything like that, because those just give you more exposure and, uh, um, help you out later on. Um, then in medical school, I did a research fellowship in between my first and second years, um, where I was able to, uh, you know, do a little research in the um, uh, anesthesia world. Um, and then my medical school actually had what's called an anesthesia externship as a M4, so a fourth year medical student, um, where I got to, you know, just learn more and more about anesthesia and, and take call with the, with the on-call team. Um, so that just kind of broadened my uh, my horizons a bit. Uh, I was already going into anesthesia at that point, so it was really just icing on the cake. But it's a great year, and, and I definitely learned a lot. This picture on the right here is our typical, uh, you know, one of the typical anesthesia machines that uh, you may see if you were to shadow in an operating room um, or work in an operating room. I'll go through a lot more about what that does uh, in later slides, but uh, there it is. So. Why anesthesia? Um, I get this question a lot. Um, and so I've come up with these reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, you may have different reasons that you're interested in anesthesia. Um, and so 
um, you know, these are just the ones that, uh, that I have put together. So first, um, I love physiology, pharmacology, all those sorts of things. So it's really the interaction between, you know, physiology and pharmacology that I do every single day um, in the operating room. And it's really the acute physiology um, that I see. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really great experience um, and it's really, really fun. So um, beyond that, I just love being in the operating room. Um, you know, definitely the operating room is for some people. It's not for everyone. But uh, I definitely enjoy it, and uh, you know, it's it's a good time, and it's you know, I never really wanted to be in a clinic setting, so um, you know, it's perfect for me. Um, the other things, uh, you know, we do a lot of procedures, um, so central lines, uh, IVs, epidurals, all those sorts of things fall into kind of the anesthesiologist toolbox, um, and so we get to do things with our hands, which is always nice because uh, we can. Um, you know, kind of break up our day with, with those types of procedures and, and it makes things fun. Um, the other, uh, you know, and the other reason is uh, we're able to work with, you know, very different specialties on a daily basis. So, you know, one day uh, um, we will uh, be working with orthopedics. The next day, you know, we're in the cardiac ORs. The next day we're with a neurosurgeon. So it's really just a variety of cases that we see um, and we can see, which is awesome. Um, you definitely can specialize. So like I said before, I'm going into cardiac anesthesia. So I'll spend most of my time in, in cardiac ORs, but I also have the ability to go do, you know, lap, lap, uh, or, uh, general surgery cases, uh, orthopedics, whatever I choose to do in the future. Um, kind of going along with the interaction between pharmacology and, and physiology, you know, if I see a, a vital sign that I don't like, such as low blood pressure, I can, you know, have a direct impact on that. And I give the medicine you know, I, I know that the patient's taking the medicine because I know I'm giving it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't have to uh, wait for, you know, the patient to come back in three months and, and kind of see how the medicine works. You know, I, I can see the immediate effect um, right away. The one uh, downside, potentially, depending on how you look at it, is, you know, there's very little continuity of care. So we don't really take care of patients for a long-term setting. Uh, typically, it's, you know, one surgery and, and that's it. You do get your frequent flyers, in which you'll see multiple times. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, sometimes okay. Sometimes, you know, you wish you didn't necessarily see those individuals more than once. But, you know, we're not going to see them in clinic afterwards. You know, we don't really follow them up. Um, for me, that was kind of a positive. Um, you know, I kind of liked, you know, meeting individuals, having an impact on them uh, for the acute setting of, you know, their surgery. And then after that, um, you know, I, I don't have to go see them in clinic, uh, uh, you know, down the line. So, all right. So what is anesthesia? What is anesthesia? Um, so there's four pillars of anesthesia um, and they're classically described as analgesia. So that's pain relief, um, uh, paralysis, so muscle relaxation. Uh, amnesia, so the loss of memory, and then unconsciousness. So if you can see on the bottom of the screen here, I've set up kind of a, a continuum. And this is how I explain to my patients, you know, um, the, the kind of levels of anesthesia, because that's something you guys will, you know, in, uh, encounter if you go into the field is, you know, people don't know what really anesthesia is a lot of times. And they've heard stories about people waking up and, you know, there's movies about people waking up during surgery and, and all these things. Um, and so I like to use this kind of continuum. Um, on one end is the awake uh, state, and so that one's pretty easy to explain. On the other end of the spectrum is the, uh, the asleep state. So, um, you know, that, uh, that's what we call general anesthesia. Um, in the middle here is where it gets kind of gray, uh, and that's called sedation, or uh, we refer to it often as monitored anesthesia care. Um, and so um, what we can do is, uh, uh, you know, give some, a little bit of medicine to the patient and get them comfortable, but they're not to the point where they need to be fully asleep. Um, so on the awake side, uh, we have local and regional anesthesia. So those are typically things that, uh, you know, we can do local anesthesia. You guys may have had it already. Um, you know, dentists often do that in their clinic um, for minor uh, dental work. Regional anesthesia is a form of anesthesia where we give uh, patients uh, medicines such as lidocaine or, or, or its cousin. Um, medicine, bupivacaine, and it numbs up nerves. So this is really good for orthopedics, um, and there's many other cases where that can be used. Um, but I'll uh, I'll mention kind of more about regional anesthesia later on. I mentioned the sedation and modern anesthesia care is kind of in the middle. Um, that's where the patient's in this. We often refer to it as twilight sleep. 
Um, and so they're asleep, but they're not to the point where we need to place a breathing tube typically. Um, and that, that type of anesthesia is called general anesthesia. Um, so that's on the far right hand of the spectrum um, where the patients are fully asleep. That's what you traditionally think of when you think of anesthesia um, for surgery. Um, so, all right, so there's three phases of anesthesia that uh, you know, if, if you were to shadow me in, in real life, I'd talk to you guys about. Um, so the first one is induction. So this has always been talked about as kind of like a plane taking off, right? So um, this is uh, induction of anesthesia is at the beginning of the surgery. It's when we're, we're first getting the patient off to sleep. Um, and uh, we use certain medicines, which we'll, uh, we will go, uh, go through uh, when we go through the case presentation. Um, but uh, it's just kind of that first part of, of anesthesia. Then we get to maintenance. And so this is when you're kind of on autopilot, right? So you've already reached your cruising altitude. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're just kind of making sure everything from the vital standpoint looks great. Um, but uh, other than that, there's, there's, you know, generally very few things that you need to do um, in that phase. And then lastly, emergence. So this is what is classically referred to as the landing uh, phase, if you think about it in terms of plane. Um, and so what you can do is you can think of these three phases as, you know, applying to each type of surgery. Um, and so each phase, you know, uh, or each surgery has these phases. Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of how we, we think about things from, from the anesthesia side. So I just want to briefly touch on a little bit of history of anesthesia because I think it's really interesting. Um, so nitrous oxide uh, or laughing gas was uh, actually found um, or discovered back in the 1700s, uh, 1777, by a guy, by a guy named Joseph Priestley. Um, and, uh, this kind of, you know, they started using nitrous oxide for, you know, very minor procedures, um, and, uh, it, it became kind of the favorite. Um, and then in the 1840s, um, ether was, was found to be, um, great for surgical anesthesia. Um, so some of you may know about the ether dome, um, or have heard that story, um, that was out in Boston. Um, and that's where the first time ether was publicly known, uh, publicly used for anesthesia. Um, and so I believe the, the surgery then was they were taking a mask from the, from the patient's neck um, and they, they, they gave the patient ether for that. Um, the first in, uh, tracheal intubation, uh, so basically the first breathing tube placements were in the 1800s, 1880s to be specific by a guy named Joseph Dwyer, o. Dwyer. Um, and uh, sometimes these are referred to the first uh, uh, endotracheal tubes uh, were called O'Dwyer tubes. Um, uh, referencing his name. So I'll get more into this when we're talking about the, the case, but basically the mainstay of our maintenance phase of anesthesia. So once the patient's asleep, uh, we turn on uh, what we call volatile an anesthetics or inhaled anesthetics. So, you know, if you ever see this word fluorine at the end of a, sorry, uh, the word fluorine at the end of a, uh, a, a drug name, that's basically an inhaled anesthetic. Um, so these were actually synthesized back in the 1960s. Um, and then kind of the word, the enfluorine is not uh, used anymore in the, in the United States. Isofluorine is still used uh, in some instances. Um, Desfluorine and sevofluorine are also two different uh, types of kind of uh, these volatile anesthetics. Um, and as you can see, these weren't invented until the 1990s, um, which isn't that long ago. So um, you can kind of see anesthesia is a fairly young field uh, in general, and uh, we're still evolving. So. Um, in terms of IV anesthetics, uh, which we will get to uh, shortly uh, during the case presentation, um, both didn't really come along until the 1900s. Um, and so, um, you know, they were using ether and, you know, uh, and nitrous oxide for a long time before the IV anesthetics came along. Um, and, uh, you know, propofol, which is a very, you know, common uh, medicine used today, actually wasn't invented until 1977. Um, so I think that's really interesting that, you know, we, that's relatively young in terms of you know medicine and uh, the history of medicine. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's it hasn't been long around for that long. Um, beyond that, you know, I'll talk about the muscle relaxants later in the case presentation. But basically, uh, one of them that we use today, uh, succinylcholine, um, wasn't uh, used in humans until 1949, and then rocuronium uh, in 1994. So, both pretty young medicines. Um, so. Let's talk about a, a typical day in anesthesia. Um, so 
usually between 6 and 7 a.m., uh, you know, you arrive at the hospital. Uh, it really depends on how your hospital specifically does uh, their surgeries. Sometimes, you know, I've seen surgery start as early as 6 a.m. Um, for, for a normal day, and then other times they don't start till 8 or 8.30, so it really just depends. But basically, the first thing you got to do is set up your OR. So on the picture, or in the picture on the left, uh, this is just, you know, kind of a basic setup for a lot of the drugs that we would be, you know, drawing up and making sure we have available. Um, and so I'll go through it, you know, a little bit more in depth when we go through the case. But as you can see, you know, there's some, uh, you know, there's some fentanyl here. There's some propofol, which is this white liquid here. And then I've got, you know, you've got muscle relaxants here and some emergency drugs back in the back, the ephedrine and, and phenylephrine if you need to, you know, give it for blood pressure reasons. Um, and so uh, that's kind of a basic setup, uh, if you will. Um, after that, you, you usually visit with your first patient um, and they're, you know, getting their IV from the pre-op nurses, they're getting checked in, all those sorts of things. So you just go talk to them um, and I'll kind of go over what, uh, uh, what you talk to them about uh, when we go through the case presentation. Usually between 7 and 8 a.m. is when you start your day. Uh, most ORs start between these hours, but like I said, it can vary between hospitals um, drastically. So um, then typically in the morning, um, around, uh, you know, 9, 9 to 10.30, you get a, you know, a morning break. Um, you know, you can go sip some coffee for a little bit, eat a snack. Um, you know, if you have a short case, maybe, you know, you, you do your first case and then you go take a break and then you come back to the second case. Otherwise, you know, someone else may come give you a break in the operating room so you can go step out, use the bathroom, any, any sorts of things like that. Um, and then, you know, we typically get lunch someday, someday uh, you know, sometimes in the, as early as 11 a.m., sometimes as late as, you know, 1 or 2 p.m., um, and it really just depends on the hospital setup that you have. Um, and then, you know, if you're doing a lot of different cases in one day, um, you may be finishing cases still and, and starting new ones throughout this whole time period. If you've got a long, you know, one long case, which is, you know, pretty common, then you may, you know, you may never leave that same OR outside of your breaks and your lunches. Um, and so, um, you know, those those are really great rest periods because uh, you can get really fatigued looking at the same screen for hours and hours and hours. Um, it can get kind of uh, monotonous at times. And then generally between 2 p.m. And, and 6 p.m., you're generally done for the day. It depends if you're on call or not. Um, and so this is a wide range. Um, you know, obviously if you're on call, you may even stay past 6 p.m. Uh, it's not a guaranteed cutoff. Um, but some days you may get out as early as 2 p.m. And so you know, as you can see, if you work from six to two, that's not a bad day. Um, but there, there definitely are days where it's a little bit longer than that, and, and you may have to stay later, especially if you're on call. So, um, let's talk about the path of being an anesthesiologist. Um, so, many of you are in the undergrad phase, uh, all of you probably. Um, so, four years of undergrad, um, then you go on to med school, you do all four years of med school. Um, typically during your third year of med school, you can get a, depending on which school you're at, you can get a uh, kind of a taste of anesthesia through, you know, maybe a two week uh, time period where you're, where you're working with anesthesiologists and anesthesia residents. Um, and then usually during your fourth year of uh, medical school, there's a longer experience you guys can take advantage of. Usually it's up to four weeks. Um, and that's, uh, you know, you get to practice intubating, put IVs in, you know, you may get a central line or two out of it, um, all those sorts of things. Um, and then four years of residency. So the first year of residency is uh, classically referred to as the internship. Um, and so if you guys know, you know, kind of what the typical internship looks like, you know, you're, you're on the, the wards, uh, you know, taking care of medicine patients, maybe you're on a surgical team uh, taking care of, you know, surgical patients. Um, and it, it's really just learning how to be a doctor in general. Um, you know, it's a lot of, unfortunately, it's a lot of grunt work and, you know, putting orders in, writing notes, all those sorts of things. Um, but then your, uh, your PGY two through four, so PGY means postgraduate year. Um, so basically the year, uh, it's a, it's a count that, uh, or it's a up, up counting system for the years after you graduate from medical school. So essentially PGY two through four, um, are your clinical anesthesia years. So, um, they're often referred to as CA, uh, you know, one, two, and three. Um, so if you were to take my, uh, circumstance, for instance, um, I'm a CA three, um, so I'm a third year clinical anesthesia resident, but at the same time, I'm a PGY-4 because I did the internship for a year. Um, and so it's kind of a, a nomenclature uh, thing, but uh, it, it's confusing no matter how you look at it. So after residency, you can go on to practice uh, and have a great career in anesthesia. You don't have to do a fellowship. That's one of the great things about anesthesia. Uh, you can find amazing jobs out there without having to do a fellowship. 
However, if you do want to do a fellowship, they're all one year long. Um, and it's really awesome because you just tack on an extra year and you get all this extra experience that then you can take to your job uh, in the future. Um, and so um, some examples are uh, cardiothoracic uh, anesthesia, which I'm doing, OB anesthesia, uh, chronic pain management, uh, regional anesthesia, which I mentioned before, that's like nerve blocks and uh, and, and giving those uh, patients an extra opportunity for different types of um, uh, of pain control. Um, neuroanesthesia, so anything in the brain uh, or spine, um, there's a specialty uh, for that in anesthesia, and then pediatric anesthesia um, as well, so taking care of children uh, during surgery. Uh, so I just wanted to touch on uh, CRNAs a little bit. So CRNAs are certified registered nurse anesthetists, um, and so you know, you may have heard stories, especially those of you interested in anesthesia uh, already, that CRNAs are a threat to the, to the field and, you know, they're going to take over our jobs. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys just a little uh, information about them um, and uh, we can, uh, you know, discuss it further if you're interested. So basically, CRNAs are, uh, they're fully trained nurses. Um, so they go through four years of nursing school uh, leading to a, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing or BSN. They then typically have to do at least one year of critical care nursing in an ICU setting. Uh, and that's, you know, the requirement for all of the, the RNA schools, um, which are uh, spread out through the country. Um, and they're, uh, you know, uh, two or three years long, depending on which school you're interested in. Um, and so, you know, after those two or three years, uh, essentially they're, they're treated like residents during those two or three years. And so after those uh, years, then they become uh, CRNAs. And so, uh, these individuals often, you know, they, they serve as extra providers. So one anesthesiologist may be watching over, you know, four, three or four CRNAs at, at one time. Um, and so it limits the number of uh, anesthesiologists that you need, um, and it provides uh, more opportunities for care um, to patients. So um, if they, you know, are, are they a threat to the field of anesthesia? I would say maybe. Um, honestly, this debate has been a lot around since I was the pre-med, um, and, you know, it's going to be around for, for the near future. Um, so some ways that you guys can think about this and the way that I thought about this is doing a fellowship can separate yourself. Um, you know, that extra training does, you know, mean that you're more qualified in some uh, instances, especially for like cardiac or pain management. Um, those sorts of things can help you uh, with job security in the future uh, if you're concerned. However, kind of learning to work with the CRNAs as an anesthesia team is going to be a big concept in the future. And, and, you know, there's no animosity. There shouldn't be any animosity between the two groups. Um, you know, I, I work with CRNAs all the time. Um, as a resident, you know, I'll give them breaks or, you know, I'll, uh, I'll you know, kind of help them set up cases. Um, and so it's really, you know, they're, they're part of the team and it's awesome um, because they're willing to, to help us out. And, you know, sometimes they may do cases that we don't necessarily, you know, want to do as residents. So, when you guys get to the residency phase, um, you, you'll appreciate them quite a bit. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I don't think they're going anywhere, um, but also I don't think they should go anywhere. So they definitely have their place in, in the world of anesthesia. Um, so it's more about working together with them in the future. Um, so, all right. All right, so we're right at this halfway mark. Um, I would like to open it up for 10 minutes of, of questions, um, if you guys have any at this time. Um, and uh, if you guys have any questions, just throw them in the chat box and we will go through them um, for roughly 10 minutes and then we'll move on to the case. Hi everybody, I'm a team leader for the pre-med scene and I'm going to be reading out some questions. Um, I would like to say, we won't be able to answer every question since it's only a 10 minute Q&A session, but I will try to get to as many as possible. Um, so our first question is, Dr. Janik, do you have any social media that you would like to give out? Yeah, so I definitely do. Um, the main social media I have is Instagram. Um, so it's just at getadmittedmd. Um, I post uh, three times a week. Uh, everything from, you know, pre-med advice to med school advice, even residency stuff. So, 
Um, if you guys would like to follow me on that, I would definitely appreciate that. And I uh, am definitely open to suggestions. So if you guys want to see anything out there that, you know, I haven't covered, uh, you know, feel free to just uh, uh, let me know. And I'd be more than happy to, to address those, those questions. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question is, if you could tell your past self any advice, what would it be? Uh, that's a good one. Um, just in general, I guess I would just say, it, uh, I think I got bogged down in kind of the whole pre-med experience. And, you know, I was spread very thin uh, as a pre-med. I was doing research. I was doing volunteering, shadowing, um, uh, mentoring, a lot of different things. Um, and I kind of looking back, I was, you know, I was one of those applicants that just checked the boxes, if you will. Um, meaning I was doing a lot of activities, maybe just because I wanted to, you know, check those things off the list to, uh, to show application uh, admissions committees, you know, that uh, I did it. Um, if I could go back, I would maybe just view it a little bit differently and really focus on things that I was interested in at the time, um, because that would have led to more um, you know, or I could have talked about them better um, during interviews, during my application, everything like that. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of an, ab uh, an advocate for doing stuff that you enjoy um, as a pre-med uh, because your, your time, your free time will only diminish during med school. And then, you know, as a resident, it'll diminish even further. Um, so really do things that you enjoy. And, and, you know, if you can make them medically related for your application, then that's awesome. Um, but, uh, yeah, maybe just doing a little bit more, you know, self-care and, and making sure I'm, I'm doing things for myself, um, and, and wellness type of stuff. So. Thank you. Our next question is, do you work with a variety of ages or do you have to specialize? Uh, a variety, I'm sorry, I missed that, uh, a variety of ages? Ages. Like, like patients? I'm taking... Yeah, so, you know, uh, the general anesthesia training, uh, so residency, will teach you how to take care of everyone from a one-day-old to 99 years old and beyond. So, um, as a resident, you learn everything, um, and, you know, we rotate, uh, you know, basically monthly um, to different various rotations. Um, so, pediatrics is one that we rotate through, so we learn how to take care of kids. Um, you know, we rotate through cardiac anesthesia, we rotate through, um, you know, basically everything. And so we do learn how to take care of every, you know, age group, every demographic, every, you know, type of patient. However, after residency, you can really make your practice what you want it to be. So if you don't want to do pediatrics and you don't want to take care of, you know, kids, that's totally fine. Um, you, you can find a group that, you know, or a job that doesn't make you take care of kids. Uh, if kids is your thing, perfect. You know, uh, that's one of the fields of anesthesia that doesn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, people going into it typically. And so that leads to great job security. Um, kids are a little scary to take care of in the operating room. Um, and, uh, you know, that adds a little bit extra stress to the, to the situation. So um, basically, whatever you guys want to do, um, you can do. Uh, and uh, you can uh, specialize in whatever you want to, do, to specialize in, which is awesome. Thank you. Our next question is, what made you want to pursue a cardio fellowship? Yeah, so actually, um, my, my father was uh, ill when I was an undergrad, so I was a sophomore um, when he, he had a heart attack and, and went to heart failure. Um, so I was initially thinking about doing interventional cardiology, so you know, putting stents in, uh, in uh, coronary arteries and, and all that sort of thing and taking care of patients having heart attacks. Um, and, you know, I, I really did enjoy kind of that, that atmosphere. However, it just wasn't enough, you know, physiology for me. Um, and so I learned about anesthesia um, and, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to focus on, you know, more the physiology. That's what kind of got me interested. Um, and to be honest, honestly, the training for an interventional cardiologist is very long. Um, you have to go through an internal medicine residency, which is three years, a cardiology fellowship, which is another three years, and then uh, you have to do further fellowships into, you know, interventional cardiology. Um, and so for me, that, that just didn't really seem like it would fit my life goals. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I found the anesthesia, I fell in love with it. Um, and, uh, you know, the combination between cardiac anesthesia and, uh, and just general anesthesia is, is an amazing combination. Um, and so I still get that, you know, kind of cardiac atmosphere and, and, you know, I learn more about the heart and I'll, you know, I'll be, uh, you know, able to take care of those really sick patients. Um, 
and you know it's uh it's just you know it's fun so cardiac anesthesia to me is uh it's just fun there's a lot of stuff going on it's very busy if you guys have ever seen an open heart procedure before it's incredibly complicated and busy um but that's kind of the environment that i love so um that's that's kind of how i chose uh, anesthesia or cardiac anesthesia specifically awesome thank you our next question is do you witness surgery as much as someone who chose surgery for their specialty Meaning, are you alongside the surgery the entire time? Yeah, so definitely as a resident, you're, you're in the room uh, the whole time. Um, and so outside of those, you know, 15-minute breaks in the morning, 15-minute break in the afternoon, and, and 30 minutes of lunch, you're, you're basically in the, the operating room that whole time. Um, you know, that is the kind of the academic model in private practice. Um, if you're a practicing anesthesiologist, then uh, you may not uh, you may not be in the room the whole time. Um, if you're working with CRNAs, um, typically they're in the room the whole time, and you're kind of floating in between, you know, multiple operating rooms, making sure everything's going smoothly. Um, there are private practice models where you know the, the anesthesiologist is doing the, the entire procedure themselves, um, and so they're in the operating room that whole time with the surgeon. So you can observe, you know, you know, you can look over the if you've seen the operating room kind of set up, you can look over the drapes and you know you can see everything that they're doing and then uh you know the surgeons often like you know will explain to you what they're doing which is awesome um and so uh it, it kind of depends on what your what your job is but um and what the setup is at your hospital but you can be in the operating room as much as you want um and uh, there are definitely jobs uh, that allow you to do that thank you our next question is how does anesthesia play into prenatal surgeries uh, so I guess that's a, that's a complicated question. Um, are you, I guess, are they asking about, um, whether or not, uh, a mother who's pregnant is having surgery? Um, I guess, uh, I could take it as, I can interpret it as that. Um, and so it's definitely a, a delicate balance, um, because there's two humans there, right? So, you know, when a, when a mother's pregnant, they can still have surgery. There are certain instances where they, you know, they need to have surgery during the pregnancy period. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have to be very careful with the medicines we choose. Um, there's certain medicines that we want to avoid during that time period. Um, and so one of the, the best examples of that is uh, 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 Versed or Midazolam, which I'll go over in the, in the case presentation, but uh, that actually has, you know, a very high, uh, uh, it's called a black box warning um, for, for some pregnant individuals. So um, we definitely want to avoid that. Otherwise, it depends on the time frame of where the, the uh, female is in the pregnancy period. So if they're first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester, um, you know, we have to take different things into consideration. Um, and so it does become a little bit more complicated. The further along in the pregnancy period that the, the mother is in, then, you know, typically we'll have to bring the OB, uh, OB-GYN team in, um, and they'll, you know, they'll basically attach a monitor to the, to the patient's uh, stomach to monitor the fetal heart tone. Um, and uh, uh, so it adds a little bit more complexity um, to the case, but it's definitely doable uh, for sure. All right, thank you. So our 10 minute Q&A session has now ended. Thank you, Dr. Janikzak for answering all of the questions. I apologize for not getting to everyone's questions. We will be having another Q&A session at the very end of the session. Yes. Um, so let's move on to, I wanna kind of take you guys through a, a simple case um, to, to show you how you know, I would think about this. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully give you guys a sense of, you know, what we do as anesthesiologists um, in the operating room. Um, and so let's dive right in. So just imagine, uh, fast forward a couple years, you're now a PGY2, so a second year resident. Uh, and, you know, with the CA system, you're basically a, a first year anesthesia resident. Um, you're on call on a Friday night. Um, and uh, there's a laparoscopic appendectomy um, coming up from the ER. Um, and so they let you know that, uh, you know, they want to start the case in 30 minutes, uh, for instance. So after you kind of get out of bed and dust yourself off, uh, you know, you start thinking about what you're going to do. So you decide to go to the OR first uh, and set that up so that you can get that uh, knocked out and checked off the list. So you start thinking, you know, what supplies or equipment do you need? Um, so typically, 
you know, obviously there's, there's certain things that you need to be aware of. And uh, this is kind of the framework we think of things are, or think of things uh, when you go to set up a case. So um, the first thing is machine. So just like that picture I showed you guys before, the anesthesia machine, typically they don't need the operating room. So that is, uh, you know, pretty much uh, stationary and they just, you know, that'll be there. Um, suction. So suction is really important to the anesthesiologist um, because we do so much work in the airway, um, whether we're intubating or, you know, if we're doing a sedation case, you know, we're still concerned about the airway. Um, so having suction on board is uh, and available and ready is, is very, um, very important. Um, and so um, outside of that, uh, monitor. So the, I'll talk about the, the monitors that we use uh, in a minute here. Um, but basically, you know, you need the EKG, um, so electrocardiogram, you need a pulse ox, um, so you can monitor the, the oxygen content of the blood. And then, um, the typical uh, other standard, uh, uh, monitor is a blood pressure cuff. Um, so I'll talk about those things uh, a little bit more, um, as we go through. So as you're starting to set up the OR, um, these thoughts keep rolling through your head. Um, so what type of anesthesia will you provide? Um, and so as, uh, as I kind of alluded to before, you know, we can go from any, anywhere between regional anesthesia to sedation to general anesthesia. Um, for this case, we're gonna need general anesthesia. Um, and uh, it, you know, that's based on the fact that it's a laparoscopic case. Um, so what that means is uh, basically they'll use a little video camera um, to uh, uh, basically see where they're, where they're working. And so they put what are called torques in, in the abdomen um, and basically use a, a little camera and then they put another port in for tools and instruments and then uh, they have it on a screen and they basically, it's, it's kind of like a video game. They kind of watch, uh, watch the screen while they're doing the uh, surgery. Um, the next question, do you need any additional IV access? This is unknown at this point. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends on what kind of, a, what kind of IV that the patient comes uh, from the emergency room with. Sometimes they come with good IVs, sometimes they come with ones that don't work. Um, will you need an additional one? Probably not. Um, I think if you can, uh, you know, have a good, one good working IV should be fine for this, uh, for this procedure. Um, do you need an arterial line? So an arterial line is a special type of IV that measures blood pressure on a beat to beat basis. So if you think about it, the blood pressure cuffs that you typically think of when you go to the doctor's office, we have those in the operating room too, um, but they only take a blood pressure every one minute at its, uh, at its best. Uh, and so, you know, if you're doing a big case, like a cardiac case, if you're doing a transplant case, something like that, you're going to need an arterial line because blood pressure can change so drastically so quickly um, that the, you know, the one minute cycle time for a blood pressure cuff is just too long. Um, and so you need that extra information. For this case, you probably don't need it. Um, and then, uh, so basically what drugs do you need to draw up? Um, and so we'll kind of go through this uh, in, in the next slide or two, but uh, basically um, you'll need, uh, you know, drugs to get the patient off of sleep. You'll need, uh, you know, drugs to uh, keep them asleep. You'll need drugs to uh, uh, have neuromuscular relaxation. Um, so all those things need to be thought about ahead of time. Um, do you need antibiotics? Often this is driven by the surgeon. Um, so you can often ask the surgery team, hey, do we need antibiotics for this? Um, based on, you know, recent rates of surgical site infections and everything like that, antibiotics are a huge uh, component of um, the, you know, kind of the total package of anesthesia that we provide. Um, let's see, uh, you know, what are the patient's most recent labs? Um, you know, for a laparoscopic, you know, for a lap appy, it's really not as important, but it's still important to to kind of know what their what their labs are, um, you know, main things hemoglobin. Make sure they're not you know very anemic um, because then you may have to give them blood if if they were. Um, for bigger cases where blood loss is more possible, then uh, you know obviously you need to think about uh, what their starting hemoglobin is. And then lastly, like what information is your attending going to ask? Um, as you're a resident and a younger resident, uh, you know, they're, they're going to ask you a little bit more about like, how would you go about this case um, and, and try to test you on, on that. Um, and so all these things are kind of going through your mind as you're standing up the OR. Um, and so as you, if you kind of think about that ahead of time, then, you know, at one o'clock in the morning, you can still think about all these things. Um, and as you go along in your anesthesia training, these, these things just become more and more uh, easy to go through. Um, so as a junior resident, you may have to think about these a little bit harder. Uh, as a more senior resident, these are just kind of standard things that you, you know, you just kind of know about. And that's just experience um, and, and doing many, many, many cases uh, over the years. Um, so after you set up the, the operating room, you look uh, the patient up in the electronic medical record or EMR. 
So you find out he's a 19 year old male, 75 kgs uh, or kilograms, and his BMI is 24. Um, so not a big guy. Um, his uh, history of present illness or HPI uh, said that he had sharp abdominal pain that started near the umbilicus two days ago and is now in the right lower quadrant. Uh, he's had a little bit of nausea and vomiting uh, a couple times uh, since that pain started. And then he's had a fever up to 102 degrees uh, Fahrenheit today. His past medical history or PMH uh, is just significant for childhood asthma. Uh, he no longer takes uh, inhalers. He hasn't had an asthma attack in years. Um, and uh, he's never been hospitalized or intubated for his asthma. Surgical history is unknown. Uh, the note that you read did not have that, so we can ask about that uh, in, the, in the interview process. Uh, his family history is only significant for some diabetes in his mother, uh, hypertension uh, or high blood pressure, and then high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia in his uh, father, and then his father also has some obesity. Um, Social history-wise, uh, ETOH or ethanol, uh, he doesn't drink. Uh, he smokes marijuana daily, uh, but no tobacco. Um, and uh, he denies any uh, illicit drug use, such as cocaine, heroin, uh, methamphetamines, anything like that. So now you go see the patient. So you know a little bit of history about them, but you don't know all of it. So there's a few more questions that you, you do want to ask. So. First one is any previous anesthesia. Um, and so what we're really trying to figure out is if they had any complications uh, from the anesthesia before. Um, and if, if so, then there's certain things that we need to you know, kind of avoid. So one thing that you know, can be a side effect of anesthesia is nausea and vomiting after surgery. So that's based on the medicines that we give patients during the, the surgery itself. Um, they, can, they can be kind of nausea and vomiting inducing. Um, so knowing that ahead of time does change our management in, in terms of we can give them different medicines, we can give them, uh, you know, what are called antiemetics or medicines such as Zofran, if you've heard of that, um, and uh, there's a bunch of others that we can give them as well to, to help prevent that, because it's not a comfortable thing to just have surgery and then be really nauseous and, and want to vomit, um, you know, I, I can't imagine how bad that would be, so. Uh, we try to do everything that we can to minimize those, those side effects. And if we know about these things ahead of time, then we can definitely plan uh, a better, you know, a better course and, and better anesthetic. Um, and then uh, the next question we always ask is any family history of anesthetic complications. So with this question, we're really interested in a very specific type of uh, complication called malignant hyperthermia. Uh, this is a genetic disease that uh, can be passed between family members and uh, what it is is it leads to a very high, it can lead to a very high fever during surgery from the anesthesia that we give you. Um, and uh, it, it can lead to muscle rigidity. Um, so basically your muscles just kind of tense up uh, and uh, it can actually be deadly. So uh, it's very important if, if, if the patient has a family history of this, that uh, we take very, very good precautions uh, to avoid certain medications, uh, such as those inhaled anesthetics that I mentioned before. Um, and then, uh, so we basically can't give them an, uh, any uh, inhaled anesthetics, and then we can't give them succinylcholine, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so, you know, that's a very important question to ask um, of basically every patient that we take care of. Um, moving on, uh, any allergies to medicines? Um, so this is kind of a no-brainer. We don't want to give them any, uh, uh, any medicines that they're allergic to, uh, inducing an allergic reaction. So if they know about any medicines ahead of time, then we, we definitely want to, um, you know, avoid those and, and make note of those. Um, last PO intake, sorry. So the last PO intake uh, basically means the last time they ate or drank anything. Um, and so that's really important because when we put a patient to sleep for general anesthesia, um, there is a risk of what's called aspiration. So stomach contents come up through the esophagus and they can actually go into the trachea and into the lungs causing an aspiration pneumonia. Uh, which is a very, very bad complication from, from anesthesia that uh, does happen, but you know, we want to do our best to avoid that, obviously. And so um, there are other precautions we can take if, uh, you know, if the patient just ate you know, a, uh, you know, a small meal. Um, however, if you know, they ate a, a steak and potatoes uh, meal uh, or a steak and baked potato, um, you know, there's a certain time frame that we have to wait before you know, generally is considered safe anesthesia. Um, and so there's a whole list. Um, so basically a full meal, you know, most anesthesiologists will wait eight hours before uh, giving them anesthesia. Um, if you talk to the surgery team and they say, if this is an absolute emergency, it has to go now, um, then, you know, obviously we document that, you know, the emergency circumstances and then 
what happens is uh, we just take extra precautions uh, from the anesthetic side. Um, and then lastly, we just kind of go through a quick head to toe review of systems. Uh, you guys will learn about review of systems in med school a lot. Um, basically what that is, is uh, you, you just kind of ask basic questions about every single organ system and make sure that uh, you're not missing anything. So, you know, typically I start with, you know, I, I start top down. So I start talking about, you know, any, any issues in the brain, the stroke seizures, um, uh, migraines, anything like that. Um, that the, the patient has ahead of time. Um, and then I, I move my way down through the heart, the lungs, uh, kidneys, all those sorts of things until I, I have, uh, you know, a very clear picture of, of the patient. All right, so then moving on to physical exam. Um, so for anesthesiologists, airway, airway, airway is very important. Um, and so as you can see from these photos, um, this is one way that we evaluate the airway. Um, and this classification system is called the Malam Potty classification system. Um, and so when we go to write our note before the, the surgery, we, we obviously want to include this so that uh, we document what our airway exam was beforehand. So basically what you, what's happening here is the patient's uh, sitting at uh, kind of eye level with the anesthesiologist. They're looking, um, or the, the patient opens their mouth and the anesthesiologist is basically looking inside to see if they can see the uvula um, and also the, uh, the, the tonsils. So these are the tonsils kind of on the back uh, side of the mouth. Um, here's the tongue, obviously here's our, our teeth. Class one is the best. So you can see uh, basically all this space in here. Um, that's amazing. Uh, and uh, that's kind of our dream. Um, as you work your way from class one to class four, uh, as you can see, the space kind of decreases. You can't see as many structures. Um, and so uh, class four airways are ch traditionally harder to intubate. Um, and so that kind of raises an alarm flag for us and, and says we need to be better prepared and, and make sure we have all the tools and equipment that we need to, to intubate this patient. Um, a, class, a class one airway uh, is, is uh, generally non-concerning to us. Um, it, there are specific you know, instances where a class one airway does cause some issues. However, it's, it's pretty rare. Most of the time you can intubate these, these patients very easily. Um, and then class two and class three, um, as you can see, you know, class two is a little bit more like class one and class three is more like four. So it's, uh, you know, these are kind of, uh, you know, in the, in the middle, if you will. So luckily our patient that we're taking care of tonight uh, is a class one uh, airway. So there's lots of room. Typically, these are, you know, the class one airways are the younger, healthier patients, a 19-year-old uh, who's not obese uh, is, is going to fall into that classification most likely. Um, but you always want to check because you don't want to be surprised by anything. So continuing the physical exam, there's some other things we look at. So the first thing is the thyroid mental distance. So as you can see from the picture on the right, um, the thyroid mental distance is, is kind of the uh, measured from the tip of the thyroid cartilage down here at the bottom all the way to the tip of the chin or the, the mentum. Um, that's how you get thyroid mental distance. Um, and so this has been associated with a, sh a shorter thyroid mental distance. Uh, it has been associated with a more difficult airway to intubate. Um, if you have a longer thyroid mental distance, uh, then it, it's been associated with uh, an easier airway. Um, and then lastly, uh, mouth opening. Uh, you know, obviously, if the, if the, if the patient uh, was coming in for, say, a broken jaw and they can't open their mouth, that's going to make intubating them very difficult versus if they're having surgery, you know, for instance, on, uh, you know, their appendix and they don't have uh, any, uh, any airway uh, or mouth opening difficulties, then, you know, the airway should be a little bit easier. Uh, moving on to cardiac exam, so obviously we want to note what the patient's heart rate is, what their rhythm is, you know, if it's in uh, what we call normal sinus rhythm, um, so that's, that's uh, definitely the, you know, kind of the preferred uh, rhythm. If they're in atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, we want to know that uh, before the surgery, and then any murmurs that they have, um, you know, we definitely want to uh, be able to appreciate and, and know what they have ahead of time. Um, Respiratory-wise, uh, you know, it's always good to list the lung sound, um, that way, you know, if, if there's a change intraoperatively, you know, say the, the patient's uh, oxygen saturation is going down, you don't know what's going on. If you knew what their lungs sounded like before, you can listen to their lungs uh, in the operating room uh, with your stethoscope. And, you know, if they sound the same, then there's something else going on. If, you know, if all of a sudden you don't hear breath sounds on one side, uh, then you know, okay, this is a change from the before. Um, and so you can kind of further triage what's going on. And then lastly, one thing I always try to look at is IV access. So, uh, you know, a patient comes into the emergency room, may have good IV access, they may not. It kind of depends on how good your emergency room is. Um, and so you just want to test your IV before you go back to the operating room because uh, you don't want to give 
uh, you know, keep giving the patient medicine uh, if their IV is not working or infiltrated because then, you know, it's not going to work. So um, that's the basics of the physical exam. Obviously, uh, you know, we can get more in depth uh, at a later time. So now you kind of move on to the anesthetic plan. Um, and so usually what, how I think about it is, uh, you know, pre-medication. So uh, this patient is young, healthy, you know, they're active. They don't have any cardiovascular issues. Um, so I would give them midazolam or versed. So this vial on the top here. Um, that is a benzodiazepine medicine. It's, it's a cousin of, uh, if you've ever heard of Xanax. Xanax is a, uh, is a uh, oral form of that uh, kind of medicine. Uh, midazolam is an IV version. So basically that provides an amnesia. Um, so if you go back to the, the, you know, the, the pillars of anesthesia, you can you know, kind of see where everything kind of ties together. Um, so that provides some amnesia. Um, it doesn't really provide any pain control um, or analgesia. Um, and typically it doesn't cause patients to become unconscious. So um, it's really good for, uh, you know, kind of giving them a, a little, um, uh, you know, a little uh, medicine beforehand to, to calm any nerves, anything like that, uh, before heading back to the operating room. Uh, uh, and then we move on to induction. So we're going to do an IV induction for this uh, case. So. Typically what that involves is fentanyl, uh, which I don't have pictured, um, but fentanyl is an opioid medication. Um, a lot of anesthesiologists give that at the beginning of a case uh, to launch the effects of, of intubation um, so that you know, their, their heart rate doesn't skyrocket, everything like that. Any pain they may have with the intubation process is taken care of by the fentanyl. Um, so that'll be an analgesia uh, component. Propofol is our main workhorse for getting a patient asleep. So if you guys see this vial over here, um, you know, propofol is a great medicine. Uh, I know it got, you know, kind of a bad name with the, you know, unfortunately with what happened to Michael Jackson, but uh, in the right hands, you know, we use propofol every single day as an anesthesiologist uh, and we, we kind of know what to look for. Um, and so it's a very safe medicine in the, in the right uh, situation. Um, so that's really going to provide our uh, uh, unconsciousness. So propofol will put the patient into a state of general anesthesia. Uh, and so we typically give that at the beginning of the case to, to get them, uh, you know, under anesthesia and, and uh, ready for intubation. Succinylcholine, uh, this vial down here, is really um, one of our workhorse uh, muscle relaxants. Uh, and so you can intubate a patient without muscle relaxants is very difficult. And so most people don't want to do that. Um, and so they give some sort of muscle relaxation because this patient has some nausea and vomiting uh, over the past couple of days. Uh, we're going to go with succinylcholine. Um, the reason for that is that succinylcholine is a short acting muscle relaxant um, and its onset is very quick, uh, typically 30 seconds or so. Um, and, and so we don't have to mass ventilate a patient. Uh, versus if we gave the patient rocuronium, which is a different type of neuromuscular uh, relaxing drug, then we'd have to uh, basically breathe for them because it takes about three minutes to take effect. So we can't just leave that patient not breathing for three minutes versus 30 seconds is, is generally okay for them to not, you know, not be breathing. And, and uh, then we place the breathing tube and get them breathing again. So, uh, you know, it's just kind of knowing what your drugs do and what their effects are. And that's really important to, to the field of anesthesia. Um, and then intubation. So let's move on to the next slide. So how do we intubate a patient? There's so many tools we have, and this is what makes anesthesia really fun. Um, and so if you see in the top left corner here, we, this is called a video scope um, or a glide scope is the, the brand name. But basically what, what this is, is it's a little camera uh, at the end of a, uh, what we call a, a laryngoscope. Um, so what this uh, individual is holding is basically a, uh, a little, uh, we call it a blade. It's not actually sharp. It just kind of moves the tongue out of the way um, uh, to get this view. And so we can see on the screen here, that's the patient's vocal cords, right? So that's where the breathing tube has to go. Um, and so we can use this tool um, called a glide scope or video laryngoscope, um, uh, which is really cool. You can see usually that's the best way to see great anatomy. Um, and, and for teaching purposes, this is awesome because you can see what the, the individual who's intubating the patient is looking at. Um, we have definitely other options. So this is the traditional um, laryngoscope down here in the middle. Um, and so you can see that, uh, I'll show you in the next slide uh, how this would be used, but this is kind of a more of a curved blade um, versus you know, we have curved blades here on the bottom left, and then we also have straight blades. So, you know, we can, uh, you know, some uh, anesthesiologists have different preferences for which one they like. Um, some situations indicate a different uh, type of uh, blade to be used. Up here in the top right corner is called a McGrath uh, 
uh, laryngoscope. So it's very similar to this video laryngoscope uh, on the top left. However, as you can see, the screen is very tiny. These are great for portable, uh, being portable. You can take them to the ICU and intubate patients in the ICU. However, you have to deal with just this very tiny screen versus the, the big screen here on the left. Um, and lastly, uh, in the bottom right here, we have what's called a fiber optic intubation. Um, so this uh, individual is holding a uh, kind of this dark uh, fiber optic scope, um, and they're looking at this screen here. Um, and basically at the end of the fiber optic scope is a little camera. Um, and so he's driving the fiber optic uh, scope based on what he's seeing on the screen um, to, to get into the airway. So at, at some point, you would probably see a similar picture to this, but uh, he's just using a different uh, method to do so. Um, so, as I alluded to before, this is how someone actually intubates. So you can see they're kind of grabbing the laryngoscope with, with their left hand. They're holding the breathing tube with their right hand. And so what they, you know, are looking at is uh, that picture that we saw um, from before. And so you can still see, in some patients, you can see a great picture just like this um, by looking in the mouth like this individual is doing. Um, and so uh, that's kind of what we're, we're going to see. If you look at the picture on the right here, you can see that the laryngoscope basically moves the tongue out of the way. Uh, and then the breathing tube comes in behind and goes into this trachea. Um, and that's how the patient is able to breathe throughout the procedure. We hook up this breathing tube to a ventilator, um, which is part of the anesthesia machine, and that's how they breathe, and that's also how we keep them asleep with uh, inhaled anesthetics. Um, so basically, the tubing that gets connected here to the breathing tube, uh, we pump full of anesthetic um, and oxygen, and then we, we uh, you know, it goes into their lungs, and they breathe it in, it gets absorbed, uh, and, uh, and uh, keeps them asleep. Um, as you can see, the trachea is very close to the esophagus. Um, they're right next to each other. So sometimes when you're intubating, and especially when you're first starting out intubating, um, you may place the breathing tube inadvertently in the esophagus, um, which uh, isn't a, a huge deal at the, at the start. You know, if you recognize it right away, um, then uh, you can, you know, make sure that uh, you, you change, you know, you have to pull it out and then redo it and make sure it's in the trachea for it to work. All right, so like I said, this is kind of the views that we're looking for. Once again, there's a grading system for what's a good view and a bad view. So grade one view is uh, over here on the left. Um, as you can see, you can see both vocal cords very well, lots of space there. Um, you, you would just stick the breathing tube right in between those two vocal cords, um, and that's the trachea. Um, this uh, grade two view, as you can see, the epiglottis here uh, is kind of flopping over your view. So all you can really see is the bottom, which is called the arytenoid. Uh, it's the arytenoid cartilages, um, and so you can see it right here. Um, so you can still get your breathing tube in underneath here. Uh, it's just a little bit harder, maybe. Uh, grade three view gets even tougher. You can't really see anything, um, and uh, uh, all you see is really epiglottis here. And then grade four is uh, really all you see is the tongue. So this uh, kind of bumpy structure right here is the tongue. Somewhere underneath there is, is the, uh, the vocal cords um, and, and where you'd be looking. But as you can see, this is incredibly hard. Uh, and, and, you know, the success rate for this definitely goes down compared to this, um, where you can see this very clearly. Luckily, our patient is young and healthy and skinny, and their airway looks like this, so it's a very easy intubation. We put the breathing tube right in the middle there, um, and uh, he, uh, you know, gets uh, moved on to the next part of the procedure. So the patient's intubated, now what do we do? Um, many of you have probably heard that, you know, maybe anesthesiologists do Sudoku, crosswords, stocks during surgery. Well, we can't really do that quite yet. So there's things that we need to do at the beginning of the case to make sure that everything's uh, taken care of. So antibiotics, like I mentioned before, is a huge thing these days. We wanna make sure that we get those antibiotics in before the surgeon starts cutting. Um, that way that the uh, antibiotics have time to, you know, get to the bloodstream and, and uh, decrease the risk for any surgical site infection. You wanna make sure you turn on your inhaled anesthetic. So once the patient gets the breathing tube, that's when you turn on your inhaled anesthetic um, and that's what keeps the patient asleep. The propofol will, will wear off, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes later. Um, and so once you get the breathing tube in, you really need to, you know, turn on some sort of anesthetic, otherwise the patient will wake up. Um, and then you gotta worry about positioning. So if we, if we need to change positions for the patient, um, that's definitely something we need to uh, take care of before we uh, more or less relax. Uh, you know, if we use succinylcholine, that short-acting muscle relaxant for, for intubation, then we need to think about more of a long-term muscle relaxant for this case. So rocuronium uh, is kind of the, the mainstay there. And then not really applicable for this, for this surgery, but uh, for other surgeries, you know, more IV access if we need it, uh, or uh, if we need to place an arterial line, which I talked about before, or a central line. That's kind of the time when you do it, right after you intubate. 
Um, so after all those things are done, now is it time for Sudoku? Not quite. So as you go through the surgery um, and the surgeon's really starting to operate, you notice the blood pressure goes from a nice healthy 126 over 78 uh, and the next blood pressure is 79 over 49. So as you can probably tell, that's not good. Uh, that's uh, very bad. And so what happens? You know, uh, you know, one of those things that uh, is really crucial to the anesthesiologist is being able to think on your feet, taking these uh, changes in patient condition and knowing what to do about them. Um, and so, you know, also what do you need to do to fix this? So basically the long story short is for these laparoscopic cases, they pump uh, CO2 into the, into the abdomen to give them more working space uh, for their cameras and for their instruments. Um, and this is called insufflation. So what this can do is it can actually collapse the IVC or the in, uh, inferior vena cava, uh, causing decreased blood flow back to the heart uh, and decreasing preload on the heart. And then what happens is the blood pressure can tank. So um, treatment for this, you can give IV fluids, you can give medications. These are often called pressors. So ephedrine, epinephrine, phenylephrine, norepinephrine, those are all great uh, pressor medications. Um, and then uh, if none of those are working, you can ask the surgeon to decrease the uh, insufflation pressure. So basically that removes the pressure on the IVC, you get more blood flow back to the heart, um, and your blood pressure usually goes up. So, uh, you know, based on that, what do uh, anesthesiologists actually do during the surgery? So uh, here, here's one screen. Um, not every screen looks like this, but this kind of highlights the important parts. So, you know, we're constantly watching the EKG, the ECG, the electrocardiogram. We're constantly watching the heart rate, the blood pressure, uh, oxygen saturation. Um, this number, end tidal CO2 or ETCO2, basically that's the, the, the amount of CO2 that's expired um, from the patient. Um, and so uh, we monitor that for, for various things, uh, respiratory rate, temperature, um, and then you can see the CO2 waveform. Um, so we get a number for the CO2 and then we also get a, a waveform as well. Um, so we can monitor both of those things for uh, very, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, changes during, throughout the case. The other thing we really look at is, uh, this is another screen that we often have on our anesthesia machine. It doesn't always look like this, but it has the same uh, information. Um, so this is more, you know, talking about the, the ventilator settings. So as on the bottom here, you can see this is what the ventilator settings are. Um, so the tidal volume we've set at 600 ml um, uh, per breath. Um, so uh, an average, you know, uh, 70 kilo, uh, kilo male will probably take, you know, 500 to 700 uh, CC breaths per minute um, uh, at, at resting. Um, we can set the frequency of the ventilator. We can set um, uh, PEEP, so positive end expiratory pressure. That's just another setting. Um, as you can see, honestly, I don't know why they have uh, three different gases here. Um, so nitrous oxide, sevoflurane, and desflurane. This is not common. Um, I found this picture off the internet, um, but I, I think it's uh, um, you know, kind of, a, you know, gives a lot of information here. Um, uh, I would not uh, take this as normal to have all three gases on board. Um, that's uh, not usually common. But then the other thing we can see is that we're giving this patient 70% oxygen, um, which is pretty high. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know what the clinical situation was that needed this, uh, this amount of oxygen. So usually we try to do as, much, as little oxygen as possible um, uh, to keep their, their uh, oxygen saturation uh, at a normal level. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on in these two screens. And this is really what keeps us busy during the procedure. We're constantly checking these monitors um, and our machines to make sure you know, what we're setting for these ventilator settings are actually what's, what's being delivered to the patient um, and also what, uh, you know, what we're expecting. Um, and so oftentimes we don't have time for stocks. We don't have time for Sudoku. Um, that's kind of a myth from, from uh, previous times. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're keeping an eye on the patient. We're keeping an eye on all the vital signs, everything like that. And that's, you know, honestly what keeps us busy uh, while the surgeon's operating. Um, so let's fast forward to the end of the case. Uh, I know we're running out of time here, so I'm going to try to get through this quickly. Uh, but now it's time for emergence. So if you remember from before, emergence is kind of the landing phase of the, the flight, if you will. Um, so basically what we do is we turn off our inhaled anesthetic. Um, we switch to 100% oxygen um, at that point. And so we can uh, basically what we call blow off all the, uh, all the uh, inhaled anesthetic because we don't want it floating around in, in their lungs anymore. So we just kind of wash it out with some uh, oxygen, pure oxygen. Um, we want to reverse the neuromuscular blockade. So we have specific medicines that are an antidote to the neuromuscular blockade for Rocky, uh, you know, of Rocky Romeo. Um, and then the overall goal is to extubate the patient, you know, 
immediately after the last uh, stitch is placed by the surgeon or maybe the wound is banded depending on the you know the procedure um, the amount of times that this actually happens especially in an academic setting during residency is very low um, just because you know we're, we don't have the consistency um, with the you know especially with the surgery residents um, you know some surgery residents may be able to stitch faster than others so it's very hard to time However, when you're out in a private practice setting, you're working with the same surgeon, you know, theoretically every single day, you kind of know how long they're going to take to, to close a, a wound and, and uh, an incision. Uh, and so you can time this way better and, and get really good at timing it um, so that uh, you can you can be the most efficient anesthesiologist you can be. So what happens after the case? So uh, we wake the patient up, uh, breathing tube comes out, and we transfer them to the post-anesthesia care unit. So it's also called the PACU. Um, there we make sure the vitals are stable and their pain control is uh, adequate. If it's not, then we can give them other pain meds um, and make sure that they're comfortable. Um, and then we also really want to check for any post-op nausea and vomiting. So like I said, it's not a comfortable thing to just have surgery and be nauseous and, and vomiting in the PACU. So uh, there's medicines we can give them to kind of help the, the post-op nausea and vomiting as well. Um, for this case, uh, you know, a, a simple appendectomy, um, you know, the, the patient could be discharged that same day uh, or, you know, because it's the middle of the night, they could be discharged, uh, you know, early the next morning. They could also be admitted. It kind of just depends on the surgical team protocol. Um, and, and we as anesthesiologists, as long as there's nothing from the anesthesia side that is uh, prohibiting their discharge, we leave it up to the surgical team to decide if they want to keep the patient in the hospital or if they want to discharge, that's on them. Um, and then that kind of wraps it up. So if there are no more cases at the moment, then you get to go back to bed and, and wait for the next phone call. So um, just uh, before we head into questions, um, just a little bit of a summary on anesthesia and the presentation in general. So uh, I may be biased, but I think anesthesia is a great, exciting field. Um, you get tons of variety. The physi uh, physiology and pharmacology is incredible. You get to see these things you know, in real time. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do procedures all you want um, and uh, kind of, you know, keep those skills up as well. Uh, one of my attendings, uh, so one of my supervising physicians, uh, you know, has, has told me this, you know, anesthesia is 97% chill, 3% uh, complete chaos. And this ranges anywhere from 95% and 5% to 99% and 1%. Um, but basically, you know, uh, in summary that, uh, um, you know, most of the time everything goes very well. Um, and we have no issues, but, you know, when it does go, you know, south, it goes, you know, very south very quickly, and we have to know what to do and, and be able to recover those situations um, and uh, know how to, to handle it. So, some downsides to anesthesia in general, and hours can be long and exhausting um, at times. It, it kind of depends on what kind of job you have in the future. Um, like I mentioned before, not much continuity of care, so this could be a positive or a negative depending on how you look at it. Um, and then another downside I came up with, practice can be de uh, determined by the surgeons or hospital you work in. So if the hospital you work in has a bunch of, um, uh, uh, has a bunch of orthopedic surgeons, obviously your practice may be, you know, more skewed towards orthopedics. If they have a bunch of cardiac surgeons, then, then you know, it's going to be skewed that way as well. Um, so it's really, you know, a very great field for finding your niche and, you know, you can find a job doing whatever you want in, in the world of anesthesia and, and it will lead to a great career. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, we will uh, have a little, hopefully a little bit more time for questions uh, this round. So uh, go ahead and fire away. All right, so our first question is, how do you go around helping patients who are allergic to certain anesthesia that they weren't aware of that prior to surgery? Yeah, so that's a that's a very scary thing, um, and uh, you know, oftentimes the patient doesn't know their they don't know their allergies. Um, oftentimes they've never had anesthesia before, so you know, there's no reason that they would know that allergy. And so, if we do think we have an allergic reaction, um, you know, happening in the operating room, you know, it's it's uh, kind of unavoidable if we don't know about it ahead of time. So. Uh, there's certain ways that we kind of suspect an allergy or an allergic reaction in the operating room. So one of them is low blood pressure. Um, and so uh, if there's no other reason for the, the low blood pressure that you can think of uh, in the moment, you know, it's kind of a, what we call a diagnosis of exclusion. So once we've ruled everything out, um, there, uh, there's allergic reaction kind of on our differential diagnosis. And, uh, you know, we start thinking in, in terms of that, um, whether or not we can do anything about it at that time is, is tough. Um, and uh, it, it's one of those things that you 
kind of just have to explain to the patient afterwards and, and maybe the family afterwards that you think that this is an allergy and they should get it, uh, you know, kind of uh, looked up at, uh, or investigated further um, after the, you know, after they recover from the surgery and, and all that. Um, and so I've had a couple uh, situations where we thought it was an allergic reaction that we didn't know about. Um, and so basically you document everything that happened um, and then you know, you, you talk to the patient and their family members um, uh, about the, the situation and, and to know for the future, to tell the future anesthesiologist that maybe that medicine is not what uh, um, should be given. Thank you. Our next question is regarding drugs that are given based on weight and age. So do you weight the patient right before the surgery or do you account for the weight that's in the medical records? Yeah, so, you know, you can get an idea from the medical record uh, what their weight is. You know, generally, once you're, uh, you're an adult, um, your weight doesn't typically fluctuate a ton um, in between, you know, a couple months. Um, for kids, uh, so for pediatric anesthesia, that becomes a huge deal. You need a weight on the day of surgery because, as you know, you can imagine, a two-year-old is, is growing constantly. So even a weight from a week ago may not be the same. Um, and so one thing about pediatric anesthesia is that you have to really know the child's weight uh, because everything is very uh, tied to that um, on a, a, per, a per kilogram basis and everything like that. Um, for adults, you know, if, if the weight's off by, you know, you know even five ki uh, kilograms or 10 pounds, you know, typically the doses are not going to be a big deal. Um, if, you, if you have a weight from, you know, an adult patient that's, you know, six six months to a year old, maybe you want to weigh them on the day of surgery and, and make sure you get an updated weight just to make sure there's no difference. Um, but uh, really for pediatrics, it's, it's incredibly important to know uh, the weight on the day of surgery. Awesome. Thank you. Our next question is, given that fentanyl is an opioid, how would you go about treating a patient who routinely consumes opioids and has become resistant to them? Yeah, so that's a great question, and we're you know facing that uh, you know more and more each day. Um, so if you really need the opioids, the you know, and they develop tolerance uh, to it, then you know you just have to you know either give them a little bit more um, and, and just uh, plan on that, or there's other medications that you can give for pain control outside of opioids. So ketamine uh, has uh, kind of risen as a great alternative to opioids. Um, so ketamine is a, another medicine given commonly in anesthesia. Um, it has some, uh, you know, properties of pain control. Um, it also has some properties of, of uh, causing a, uh, a state of unconsciousness. Um, and so it's a great alternative. You can give other medicines such as um, there's an IV form of uh, ibuprofen um, called Cotorolac or, or Toradol. Um, that's often used uh, in patients who may be uh, un unresponsive to, to opioids. Um, and then uh, you can give IV Tylenol as well. Um, that's a great adjunct uh, to, to opioids. Um, so, you know, one good thing about anesthesia is we have, you know, a, a lot of tools for every single situation. You just have to know how to use each of them. Um, and so that's why you go to residency, because you can learn how to, you know, approach these different situations uh, and, and make sure you're treating patients in the, the most proper manner. Um, and so uh, there, there's definitely ways around, you know, kind of giving opioids. Um, which is uh, which is good. You just have to know which other drugs to give. Thank you. Our next question is: What were your study habits during undergrad, medical school, and do you have any specific tips for studying for the MCAT? Yeah. Um, so during uh, undergrad and med school. Um, or mainly during, so uh, during undergrad, um, you know, I was doing a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of extracurriculars. Um, and uh, so basically studying became something that happened at night. So I would go to the library typically from, you know, maybe 6 p.m. Uh, so I'd try to get dinner, um, you know, make dinner at home and then um, go to the library from maybe 6 to 11, you know, p.m., um, maybe midnight, depending on, uh, you know, if I had a big exam that week or a big project due. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily be a all night type of person. Um, you know, I kind of believe in the fact that, you know, you reach a limit in terms of how much information you can actually cram into your brain in any given setting. So, you know, I think five hours was kind of my limit. 
um, five to six hours typically. And so, you know, I would try to get five to six hours each night of, of studying in. Um, and, you know, during the days I'd be going to classes, I'd, you know, I'd, uh, you know, be working in the research lab during the afternoon or, you know, going to, uh, you know, my job as an anesthesia technician. Uh, and, and so that really just left the night. Um, in med school, um, it was, you know, more or less the same way. Um, you know, most of the time we had class during the day, you may have to go in for, you know, a, a small group session or something like that. Um, and then, you know, basically at night was your time or evening was your time to study. Um, once again, I wasn't really a big fan of staying up all night, you know, cramming for exams and, and, and that sort of thing. It never really worked for me. Um, and so it's one of those things that whatever works for you um, is kind of how you need to structure your time. Um, and then the other thing that uh, going back to, you know, kind of what I would have done differently is, you know, one thing in medical school that I figured out is if I, if I kind of move, you know, working out or physical activity to the morning before everything gets started, then it's out of the way. It's, it's not, you know, kind of in the back of my mind anymore. And so I can just focus on studying. So that was one thing I did during medical school is I tried to work out a little bit more in the morning if I could um, before getting my day started. That way I could just get it out of the way um, and then make sure that, uh, you know, I, I wasn't uh, taking away from study time later in the day doing that. Um, for the MCAT, um, I studied during the summer um, for the MCAT. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really tough during the semester to study for the MCAT because um, you're, you know, you're typically busy with all your, you know, your coursework and, and everything like that. Um, and so, you know, balancing your coursework and, you know, doing well in the MCAT is a, is a tough feat. Um, but you kind of just have to set aside time um, for the MCAT and say, you know, for these two hours, I'm going to study for the MCAT. For the next two hours, I'm going to study for my, you know, exam X, Y, or Z uh, and kind of go from there. Um, and so, you know, really just time management skills uh, become a huge thing at that point and just making sure that you set aside enough time to, to study for both uh, is really important. Awesome. Thank you. Our next question is, do you think being a pharmacy technician helps with learning pharmacology in the anesthesia specialty in the future? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, you know, uh, pharmacology is all about patterns. So most drugs in, in specific classes have a pattern, you know, to their name. Um, so rocuronium, for instance, has seven, you know, uh, three other, four other cousins. Uh, that all end in odium. Uh, so you kind of pick up these patterns. And so that really helps um, because when you're thinking of these alternatives that, you know, if maybe if your hospital doesn't have rocuronium, for instance, you could use, you know, these other medications and you, you kind of know um, generally what they are. You may not have used them a, a whole lot, but uh, it, it will help you kind of, you know, pick up on these patterns later on. And especially during pharmacology in, in medical school, um, which can be a very tough class. Um, you know, you, I, I think just having some background in, in the pharmacy world will definitely help you um, and, and uh, it'll make your, you know, your life a little bit easier. Um, so. Thank you. Our next question is, are there any proactive steps a patient can take before an operation to determine if they may have an allergic reaction? Honestly, no. Um, you know, there, there's really no way to know outside of having that medicine, in the, in, in, you know, given to them uh, previously. Um, and so, you know, it, it's one of those things that we try to prepare for as much as we can. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we can't expose you to every single medicine to figure out what you're allergic to. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, it would be impossible to do that. So one thing is, is if you do have a lot of allergies, um, and, and, you know, food allergies, I mean, so, you know, some patients are allergic to tomatoes, some patients are allergic to bananas, um, some patients are allergic to shrimp. Um, you know, you, you can kind of, uh, there is a correlation between some um, medicine allergies and, and those types of things. So you may have an uh, inclination that, you know, if you're allergic to shrimp, you may be allergic to medicine X. Um, but it's not a tight correlation. It's just kind of anecdotal evidence. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you haven't had that, that type of medicine before, it's, it's just really hard to know that, you know, you'd be allergic. And the, the number of allergies, you know, to, to anesthetic medicines is pretty low, honestly. So the big culprits are typically antibiotics. Um, and so you may have an allergy, uh, allergy to antibiotics that you don't know about. Um, but, uh, you know, outside of that, the, the other medicines don't typically cause you to have an al uh, allergic reaction um, very often. So that's a reassuring thing. 
Our next question is, do you always have to intubate patients in surgery? No, that's a great question. Um, and so that kind of goes back to the spectrum of anesthesia. Um, so we can do some cases under uh, sedation or monitoring the anesthesia care. And in those cir circumstances, uh, we don't have to intubate the patient at all. Um, and so, you know, if, uh, say, for instance, the patient's getting, you know, um, like a little, uh, you know, a, a skin, uh, 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 let's say a, a big skin tag removed or something like that. We don't have to put the patient under general anesthesia for that. We can just, uh, you know, give them some medicine, make them comfortable. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we don't have to put a breathing tube in. So there's still what we call spontaneously breathing. Um, and so the need for the breathing tube is not there. Um, and, uh, you know, we can, we can do cases like that. Um, you know, it's really kind of hospital dependent. Um, you know, even sometimes, you know, uh, bigger surgeries. Uh, uh, so I was just rotating at a hospital here in, in, uh, in my city that I live in where, you know, for, for hernia repairs. Um, so traditionally a surgery that you would think of as being, you know, one that you have to intubate. Um, there was a surgeon at that hospital that did not intubate uh, or did not want his patients intubated for, for every procedure, um, for every hernia, um, for instance. So, um, you know, it kind of does depend. Um, and so you kind of have to look at which, uh, what hospital um, or what norms are at your hospital. So, um, you know, there's, there's countless uh, examples of, of surgeries that you don't need to be intubated for. Um, and so uh, it, it really comes down to what surgery you're having um, and such. Our next question is, does a decrease in blood pressure happen to every patient or is it circumstantial? Uh, so that's a great question too. Um, you know, the medicine, especially propofol, does decrease uh, patient's uh, blood pressure. So um, for the most part, we'll, we will see a decrease in blood pressure um, when we give propofol. Um, the other thing, sevoflurane, that inhaled anesthetic we give patients, that decreases blood pressure as well. And so, um, you know, it, it's not 100%, you know, not every patient that gets those medicines will have a decrease in blood pressure, but more often than not, it, it will decrease your blood pressure to the extent to which it decreases, that's uh, kind of circumstantial. Um, so I can't tell you that, you know, it's going to drop your blood pressure 10 points um, every single time. You know, some patients may be more reactive to it than others. So, you know, if I gave you, you know, the same dose of propofol uh, based on your weight, it may drop your blood pressure by 10 points. It may drop mine by 20 points. It, it just really depends on the, on the patient. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we just kind of have to keep an eye on, on the blood pressure, you know, when we're giving those medicines. Thank you. Our last question is, what do you recommend to students who are struggling to keep a high GPA, but still are passionate and want to become a doctor? Yeah, so honestly, just keep going. Um, it sounds cliche, um, but I will tell you that, you know, I didn't have the highest GPA, uh, you know, in undergrad either. You know, it was definitely not a 4.0, like, you know, you always read about. Um, and so there's ways to get around that through your application. Um, and so, you know, whether you're doing, you know, a little bit more extracurricular work um, or, you know, there's, there's outside programs that you can then participate in after your under, uh, undergrad year, such as a post-bac or a special master's program, um, and you can enroll in those programs and, and do well um, and, and uh, you know, kind of show initiative committees that you're, you know, up to the task. Um, you know, honestly, if, if you're, it, it depends on your, your GPA, but you know, honestly, if you need extra help, that was one thing that I never took advantage of enough as an undergrad is, is you know, asking for help. I've always been kind of an independent person. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go to, you know, office hours as much. I wouldn't, you know, sign up for tutoring as much. Um, you know, those types of things I did not take advantage of enough. Um, and so, you know, if you're really determined to, to be a doctor, you know, there are ways to, you know, one, improve your GPA. There's also ways to kind of seek out the, you know, maybe the resources that hopefully your, your uh, undergrad school provides. Um, and so, um, you know, I would definitely look into those options. Um, and, and the other thing is, I think there's a, there used to be at least a pressure to finish undergrad in, in four years. Um, and, uh, you know, then move on to graduate school, medical school, dental school, anything like that. Um, and I think that that kind of notion is going by the wayside uh, a little bit. And, you know, I hope the stigma is just disappearing. Um, you know, you don't have to finish your undergrad in four years to, you know, be a success, right? You're not a failure if you take five years uh, and, and do things at a slightly slower pace. In fact, I know people have been very successful that have done that 
you know, taken five years to, to do their undergrad degree. And then they go on to medical school and, and become fantastic doctors. So, um, you know, I think there was always this, this stigma about taking extra time to, to do this. And, um, you know, I think just, uh, you know, kind of going at your own pace is, is fine. Um, and uh, whatever it takes to, to get you there. Um, the other thing is just, uh, you know, just uh, keep going. Um, you know, someone will read your application and, and be inspired by your story. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's one of those things that uh, there's really never an end to it. You can, you can keep going and, and find a way to do it. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Janikzak, for answering all questions. I would like to pass it off to you to say some final words, and then our influencer, Ruhi, will be explaining to all participants how to get the certificate for attending. Awesome. Um, so I just have uh, a couple things to say. Thank you to everyone who joined in uh, tonight. I really do appreciate it. Hopefully, I was able to answer your questions. Um, I know there were some in here that I uh, may not have gotten to. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram, email me, um, anything like that. Uh, I'd be really happy to, to answer those questions. Um, and then also, how can I help you, you know, going forward? Um, so, you know, through academic advising, the pre-med scene has an awesome one-on-one -on -one mentorship program that we're going to get started um, through uh, uh, the, the fall here. And uh, I'll be the leader of that program. So um, check your inboxes for more information on that. Um, and and uh, there should be a Google, a Google form that will be sent out shortly. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I, uh, I didn't mention this before, but uh, Get Admitted MD is an awesome resource. Um, I started this back in 2018 to help all of you students, you know, kind of navigate the pre-med process and uh, the uh, uh, application process as well. Um, and so head on over to my, uh, my website. You can check out what I can kind of do for you as well. Um, the big thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is there, I'm, I'm launching a uh, application boot camp starting in fall 2020. Um, and so if you follow this Google form right here, you can sign up for the mailing list. Uh, and I will uh, you know, be sending out the updates uh, when you can find that. There will be DIY options as well as uh, options where uh, you, you can go through the course and then I'll work with you directly on your application and make sure that it, it you know, everything looks stellar um, uh, when you go to apply to medical school. Um, and so go ahead and, and check on, uh, check that out as well. So with that, thank you guys again. Um, and I look forward to doing more of these sessions. Thank you so much. I would now like Ruhi to speak about certificates and our quiz. Of course. Um, so my name is Ruhi. The way certificates are going to work is that we will have a Google form um, that'll be sent out right now. And it'll also be sent out on our group me. Um, and in that Google form, there will be 10 multiple choice questions related to the presentation and what went on for the last hour and a half. And then there will also be an area for some quick feedback and then what else you want to see in terms of virtual shadowing for the pre-med scene. In order to get a certificate, you must receive at least a 6 out of 10 on the quiz that's provided, and then the certificate will be emailed to you um, within the next couple of days. This session will also be posted on YouTube so you can review it before taking the quiz um, because each person will only receive one attempt. Um, and then with the certificate, each person will get um, 1.5 virtual shadowing hours. So I'm going to send the link out right now. Um, so I sent that out and it'll also be sent out on our group me and our social media.